Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writing Wrongs on the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. My name is William L. Myers, Jr. I am your host. And today, instead of doing the normal one author interviews another author, you actually will be treated to three authors who are going to be talking about three separate books. I'm going to be talking about Matt Farrell's latest book, Tell Me the Truth, which just came out Wednesday. Um, Matt's going to be talking about False Horizon by Joe, and Joe will be talking about my last book, A Criminal Justice. We neither, none of us have done this before. We have no idea what's going to happen. So uh, everybody just buckle up. <laughs> Let me start with this. Um, Matt or Joe, why don't you just tell us what your, you know, what your life is like. You both have full-time jobs and you're both successful authors. Um, Joe, let me start with you. How did you get into writing? Um, and, you know, what is your full-time job? Sure. I, I'm a lawyer like you. Uh, I do patent cases. So I'm, a, I'm a patent litigator. I go into court and fight over intellectual property stuff, uh, a lot of high-tech stuff, computers, things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I do have a, a full-time job. I'm, I'm at the office right now. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a 40-hour week, 50-hour, 50-week-a-year you know, lawyer traveling all over the place. And, and that's kind of how writing the book started. I, I was looking for, you know, a distraction, a hobby. Uh, I was a big reader and, and I write a lot in my job and, and it's a certain kind of writing. It's legal writing, persuasive writing. And so I, you know, I read these books and I wonder, gee, can, can I write like that? You know, can, can I do that kind of writing? And so, you know, 15, 16 years ago, I, I had an idea and I sat down and um, started to to try and do it and realized I was you know way in way over my head um, and then it you know, took ten or twelve years and and finally you know several books in the can um, you know one of them hit and uh, you know that's that's how we all met is we all share a publisher but um, but but that's sort of my journey yeah and, and for people who are watching Matt Joe and I are all we're all basically kind of the same class we all came up at the same time. Um, we all have the, about the same number of books out. And so we've all faced the same hurdles and, and enjoyed the same successes. Matt, why don't you tell people uh, about your life? Where do you live? What do you do? How did you get into writing? Sure. So um, I live in Hudson Valley, New York, which is about 45 minutes north of Manhattan. Uh, my full-time job, I'm a, a commercial banker. Um, and writing has been a, a part of my life since I can remember. And, I, and that's not just hyperbole. I, I really, you know, from a young, young, young age, you know, maybe pre-middle school even just was caught, you know, always writing stories in notebooks and I would watch a movie and then write a story about it. So it's always been a huge part of my life, um, something that I'm compelled to do throughout my journey of getting published. You know, I've, I've quit a couple of times in you know, sometimes in frustration, sometimes with a pat on my back that just said, hey, listen, you gave it a good shot. It's not going to happen. Let's move on. And then, you know, inevitably four months later, I'll get an idea and I'll just be compelled to write it. So writing has been, been part of my life forever. Uh, and then I always, you know, I'm, I'm mentally more content when I'm writing. I'm happier when I'm writing. So, you know, it, for me, coming home from a really hard day at the office and writing isn't an extra thing that I have to do. It's kind of like a release from that escaping the hard day and coming into the world that I'm creating. Um, so it's never a burden. It's always just been part of my life. And um, I always seem to find a way to carve out a little bit of time each day to do it. So yeah, that's who I am. Okay. Um, Joe, you know, we're both lawyers. We both do legal writing, which is very different from fiction writing. And it's a different part of the brain. Um, do you have do you have any trouble turning the the one side of your brain off and turning the other side of the brain on to switch from different types of writing? No, not really. I, I find sometimes that my legal writing creeps into fiction writing. Um, you know, my editor finds that I use like pairs of words, right? Like like lawyers do, like aiding and abetting, and uh, you know, just find one word that'll do it. Uh, but other than that, um, no, I, I find my, my fiction writing makes my legal writing better. Uh, you know, it, 
it has sort of mentally freed me to not be afraid of sentence fragments and, and things that are more, uh, uh, more emotional or more visceral in, in my legal writing. And then I find, you know, a lot of what I do in fiction writing to be related to litigation. I mean, in litigation, we build up a case, right? Like we go out and find evidence. Um, in the books, and I don't know how you guys write, but, but I sort of start with the end, right? And then I break the mystery apart and I scatter the evidence through the book, right? And so that, that's kind of like the opposite process, but I don't know that I would be as good at that if I wasn't a litigator and hadn't gone through the, the process of you know, gathering evidence for a case and having to put it together. Matt, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a hard question. A lot of times people, like people have asked me, do you bring your real life into your writing? You know, they always ask like, oh, is this character based on someone you know, or do you have a case like that? I'm going to reverse it and I'm going to ask you, has your, has your writing come into your real life? Has it, has it made you grow as a man or a father or a husband? Are there things that you've learned from your writing that you've been able to bring to your real life and, and your real life relationships with people? I don't know that one, I don't know that it's really something that I've been conscious of, but I'm quite confident to say that I think they've always been intertwined. Um, you know, a lot of my, my characters come from, you know, suburbia, you know, my Adler and Dwyer series take place in the region that I'm living in and grew up in now. Um, the relationships that my characters have reflect relationships that I've, I'm either in or witnessed or been part of. Um, so I don't, so consciously, I would say I'm not sure. Subconsciously, I would say absolutely, both in both sides. I think my real life bleeds into my writing, and I think the stories I come up with bleed into my real life. Um, and you kind of can't help that. I mean, it's you're just you know what I, when I write, I'm not a plotter, I'm a pantser. So when I'm writing, I'm kind of stream of conscious writing, and so of course, subconsciously, you're going to have your you know your life bleeding into what your characters do or say or how they act or, or the relationships that they build and um you know sometimes the the real fiction part comes in when you have to put your mind into the mind of someone who's doing something you know super diabolical or you know something just so out of character for you and that's the fun that's the fun part for me you know i can you know i can have all my characters you know, living in a happy marriage, I'm in a happy marriage and I can relate back and forth. But when I have to really come up with a, a weird way to kill someone and try to cover up the evidence and whatnot, I, you know, that's, you know, thankfully out of character for me. So uh, you know, that's, that's where the fun begins. <laughs> so you say, honey, what do you think about disembowelment? Let's talk about that. He's like, okay, well, it's I'm so funny. You know, I'm four books in now, so everyone's a little bit used to it. But when the first two books came out, you know, my wife's friends would call my wife and say, I just read Matt's book. And are you sure you want to sleep next to him each night? And, you know, so. Oh, my wife yeah. said the same thing. She read my first yeah. book and was like, I didn't know you thought about things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who is this guy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get the looks like, what? what's going on? What's going on behind that? <laughs> Uh, so, Joe, are you um, are you an organic writer or are you an outliner? I'm I'm sort of a blend, I think. Um, I don't have you know the hundred page outline of every single thing that happens ahead of time. I generally have like a two to four page synopsis that I work off of now, um, and that kind of gives me the starting point, the ending point and several things in the middle. Like I'll know, okay, I really want to do this action sequence or I really want to have this moment. Um, and then it's about bridging those things that, and that's kind of the, the pantsing effect. And so, um, okay, how do I get from point A to point E? Well, you know, here's what B, C, and D look like and let me just, you know, figure it out um, so that, that I'm kind of in, in between. Yeah, Matt, how about you? Definitely a pantser. Um, I don't plot at all. And, you know, nine times out of 10, the ending I think I'm going to get to ends up being different or the killer who I think is going to be guilty ends up being different by the time I get to the end of the book. Um, 
for me, uh, every single book, even the ones, the unpublished ones that I've come up with has started with a scene that pops into my head. And it, I, you know, it could be a beginning and end of something in the middle, just a scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of deconstruct that scene and say, okay, who's, who are these people in the scene? Why is this happening? And from there, the story tends to get legs. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. And then that's an idea that gets thrown away and, and I'm, I'm on to the next one. But, you know, it'll it'll get legs. I'll start answering my own questions. And almost from that scene going outward, come up with kind of a, a, a beginning, that scene kind of blending in somewhere. And then what I think will be the end. And then I just start writing. And, um, you know, it, it, it's... It's probably, I don't want to say the wrong way to do it, but the way I do it, you know, lends itself to many, many, many rounds of edits. And I, I happen to love editing. So for me, it's not a big deal. But, you know, for first draft to what the, you know, what the uh, reader is reading, holding in their hands, it's probably, you know, eight, eight to 10 rounds of editing. Um, right. Some of it really, really heavy. Some of it, you know, not so much. But, um, you know, I guess that's just my method. But, uh, yeah, I, I kind of just write and go and, and see where the story takes. Me. OK, let me let me use that as a segue to your latest book. Tell me the truth. Um, and, and the part that I'm talking about is where, where you say that, you know, the person you think at the start of the book may be the killer could end up not being the killer by the end of the book. When I read this book, I changed my mind like five times on who the killer was. And there, there are so many clues and so many things about each character that there are half a dozen characters in this book who really legitimately could be the killer. Um, and that in part made me wanna move forward and move forward and find out who it was. And I, I want to tell readers at the get-go that the first four pages of this book, which is the first chapter, drew me in. I mean, you have, uh, and the premise of the book is a young girl, Jenny Moore, about to go to college, is brutally stabbed in the woods behind her parents' home. First chapter, her father comes home from a business trip, house is empty, he finds his wife in the woods covered in blood, with a knife in her hand, sobbing uncontrollably. He takes her in his arms. And this is the part that I that stuck with me. Um, he's comforting her and he, and he thinks, he knew they had to stay quiet. It was important not to wake the neighbors. So he finds his wife covered in blood, screaming and crying. And the thought is, we better not wake the neighbors. And I thought, something ain't right here from the very <laughs> beginning. This just isn't right, because that's not what you should be thinking. Um, I know this is the, the second book um, in the Adler Dwyer series. And I want to I want to start by asking about about Susan Adler. Um, she is a um, state police investigator. I know she has a very dramatic past. Um, why don't you tell tell the readers a little bit about her? What motivates her? Where is she in her life when this story starts? So Susan Adler is a New York State Police investigator, which is kind of their version of a detective. Um, was first introduced in a standalone book, my second book called I Know Everything. And there was never meant to be a series. Um, but I loved the Susan character so much that when I Know Everything was finished, I just felt like she had more to say. Um, so we, you know, she ended up kind of creating a little two book series there. Um, you know, she's, what I love about her is she's a mom of twin, young twins. Um, her husband left her kind of unexpectedly, found a, you know, started out as an affair and then ended up deciding he wanted to be with the woman that he was uh, seeing behind his, Susan's back. And so her life kind of changes from just kind of being a married suburban mom and a police investigator to suddenly, you know, a single mom with young kids who, you know, there's a balance there that I think she does a great job of, you know, kind of that work life thing. She has her uh, her mom uh, comes in to help out. And what I love about her is 
she's not superhuman. She's not, um, you know, a super cop. She's not, a, you know, this character that other people can't relate to. You know, you don't have to be a state police investigator to relate to Susan. You know, she's just kind of single mom, young kids that need her attention. She also has a job that needs her attention, trying to find that balance. And but she's smart and she's, um, you know, she's not afraid to take risks. And then there's all, always voices in the back of her head asking her, you know, are the kids OK? Are you are you balancing the right way and trying to kind of fight her way through that? Um, but, you know, a lot of the feedback that I've gotten from my readers has been that her relatability is what they love the most about her. And that she's just kind of a regular person, which was my goal starting out. I didn't want anything crazy. I didn't want a Rambo swooping in and, you know, killing everyone in sight or a Jack Reacher type character. I just wanted a regular person that regular people uh, could relate to and really pull for throughout the story. Yeah. And, and that really touched me that she is at the same time she's out there being a cop and a good cop and a smart cop. She is struggling with her personal relationships, with being a single mom, which I'm sure a lot of women out there can relate to, um, rather than being a superhuman type person. And you really can feel her, you know, just th this weight is on her from her personal life. At the same time, she's trying to solve this incredibly um, complex murder case with so many moving parts, so many different pieces. And I think if somebody, you know, people who want to read um, a police procedural, this is a pretty high end police procedural. I think it's more of a psychological thriller. I think this is, you know, it involves a detective, it involves a murder, but there's so much going on mentally with Susan and with Liam, her partner as well, that uh, it, it really qualifies as a psychological thriller and so people who like psych psychological thrillers are, are going to love this book as well. Um, having said that, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk to Joe about False Horizon. All right. Thank you so much. So, Joe. Yeah. Got it right here. <laughs> Loved it. Thanks. And as, we said, as we said before we started um, uh, recording, you know, I usually don't read these types of thrillers kind of you know, the military edge to them. Um, I am a police procedural psychological thriller type of guy. Um, but it was such a pleasure reading this. And, Thanks. you know, what I loved about it was, um, so I'm, I'm really, really bad, even with my own books, summarizing books. <laughs> so feel free to step on me if I uh, stumble. But False Horizons is your second book. Yeah. Um, with uh, Walker, what's Walker's first name? Seth Walker. Seth Walker, yes, thank you. Because he kept saying I, 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 and I just, yeah, when people yeah. refer to him, they refer to him as Walker. Um, so Seth Walker, second book in a three book series. Um, he's brought to the mountains of um, West Virginia yeah. to investigate uh, initially what, you know, a, um, a plane that was downed, a commercial airline that was downed mysteriously and stumbles across all kinds of super tech drones and echo terrorists and, you know, plots that uh, I don't want to give too much away. But, you know, what I love, the two things I loved about this book, um, besides the characterization, which I will get to in a minute, is the action that just comes out of nowhere. So, you know, maybe... Walker endeavors are going through the woods to get to a destination, but before they even get there, like a whole like scene unfolds <laughs> and all of a sudden there's explosions and gunfires and drones are coming. And it just really, really kept the pages turning. I'm a super slow reader. Um, but I banged this book out in, in a few days because I, you know, every time I put it down to do my day job or I put it down for dinner or something, um, it kept like, all right, I got to, I got to get back to see what's going on, what's going on next, which is, Thanks. you know, that's, that is what you want in a thriller is you don't want the reader to ever want to put it down. And when they do put it down, you want them thinking about it and, and counting the hours or the minutes until they can pick it back up again. And I think you pulled that off spectacularly. So congratulations. Oh, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate that. But my first question, I guess, for you will, would be, you know, 
and I'm sorry that it's cliche, but I'm legitimately interested. Like, where yeah. did you come up with this idea? Because it's there's so many different elements in it. Yeah. And none of it really, other than you flying a lot, none of it really <laughs> has to do with your actual job. So I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm blown away by the imagination of this. So, yeah, so I started out, I'm sure, like you guys thinking about, OK, I, I want to write books. Um, who's my character going to be and where are they going to be set? Right. And, and so many of the series that we read, right, are set in one town or one area. Right. Um, John Sanford, who I started reading a lot of, right, Twin Cities, right. And he knows Minneapolis, St. Paul better than anybody. And you read enough of those books and eventually you get to every neighborhood, right, in Minneapolis yeah. <laughs> and St. Paul. Um, you know, I, I'm a Navy brat. So I moved all over as a kid. Uh, I've lived in San Diego now for 20 years, but I still feel like a transplant. And I do spend so much of my time on the road that I guess I feel or felt like a pretender. Um, like I couldn't do San Diego justice the way some native, you know, Matt Coyle could do San Diego. Right. And I couldn't do some other city justice because, you know, I'm not from there and it's not my thing. So I started thinking about, okay, where can I set this, you know, series? And so I started thinking about airplanes and airports because that's frankly where I was spending all my time. And once I played with that, then it became, okay, who's, Who's going to be solving crimes in and around airports and, and uh, airplanes? And that was an air marshal turned investigator. Um, so I started playing with that idea. And then, you know, I started filling in, you know, backstory and stuff like that. Um, as far as like how he gets to West Virginia and why I picked that, um, that was an interesting choice for this book. Um, the, the first book, Takeoff, is set in the American Southwest. He lives in L.A. And there's a chase that starts in L.A. and goes um, from L.A. Uh, to different places. And so coming into book two, um, as you guys probably did when, when you were writing your series, I was, you, know, you want to keep some things the same, but you want to change some things up to keep it fresh. And so I was like, well, where's, where's the place that's most different from L.A., right? Oh, rural West Virginia. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so... Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like Justified. You know, I think of this as like the Justified episode of the Seth Walker series. Um, so, you know, he's up in the hills and hollers and he's very out of his element and, and he needs local help and, and he flounders around and, and doesn't quite know what to do. And it's a very insular community. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's also once I pick that, there's so much going on there. Right. I mean, between mining, and fracking and the opioid mm -hmm. crisis and all that kind of stuff that that the the subplots just kind of filled in and seemed natural based on the location. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you did such a great job with um, was kind of balancing between. So your characters were fantastic, but what I, I loved your um your uh heather simon character yeah um, readers seem to I'm, really like her kind of the local you know cop guiding you know walk her around and but you know one of the things i think you hit the nail on the head with was she really acts like a local cop like she knows people or you know all right well we got to we got you know uh De Devers and Walker think that, uh, all right, well, this is our guy. And she's like, well, it can't be our, this guy. I went to high school with him or whatever. Like you really get that, that local cop feel from her. And, you know, my father was a police officer in, in a small town in Westchester. And that's really how it is. You get a lot of that kind of, you know, you know, the, the store owners by their first name, as well as, you know, the, the, repeat criminals by their first name or the, you know, the weird people in town by their, and everyone kind of had, they all have a relationship and it's not all the same type of relationship. I think you pulled that off brilliantly. So Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. That's really um, sweet. I appreciate it. My second part of the question or the second part of my comment, which will lead to a question is one of the things I dread and one of the things you did an excellent job with is explaining the technology or explaining something technical without getting yeah. too deep in the weeds. Because when you're reading a thriller, you don't want a science textbook in the middle of it. You want to get to the, the next page and the next page. And, sure. you know, 
I, I use this example a lot, but, you know, when you read, you know, Michael Crichton, or when you, even more specifically, if you watch Jurassic Park and read Jurassic Park, you know, the little, the, the whatever it is, three minute video on how they got the DNA from the fossilized mosquitoes was all we needed. But when you read the book, you go through chapters and chapters and chapters of really intricate science, which lends to the credibility of the story. But if you're a person like me, who's like, I just want to see a dinosaur eat somebody. <laughs> like it's, you really have to trudge through that part of it. And, you know, you know, the way that you talked about all the different kinds of technologies, and I don't want to give too much away of the story. Um, you know, was just enough for us to understand the who, what, when, where, why, but also high level enough where, you know, we don't care how the circuit breakers are created. We just want to get to the part where people are ducking for cover and because there's explosions and, and bullets riding through the air. So talk to me a little bit about what kind of research it took to come up with you know, enough to show the legitimacy of the scene and, and, the, and the mechanics behind it, but, you know, not too much to, you know, kind of get the reader underwater with that stuff. Yeah, and that, that's really where my day job comes in. Um, you know, so I'm a technical lawyer, right? And so we do these cases and, and a lot of times we end up in front of a jury full of, you know, people off the street and we have to explain the technology to them. And so picking and choosing what they need to know versus what's, you know, sort of way too far in the weeds. Um, what's interesting and trying to make it accessible, you know, that, that's something I do in my day job and, and that's sort of filtered over to the books. I, I grew up reading, you know, Crichton and Clancy and Asimov and, and a bunch of sort of tech heavy people. Um, but I know what you mean, that, that instinct to like, can I skip this page or like these three yeah. pages <laughs> of like how the sub engine works and just yeah, like yeah, I exactly. get that it's quiet, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I, I do try to give you enough that you feel like you're learning something and, and it's all real stuff. Um, and so, you know, I do a lot of research when I'm, when I'm working on one of my cases to, to figure out how the technology works. It's the same kind of thing. I either, I either do it myself, I find subject matter experts and interview them and, and things like that. But it's, it's, a, it's a process really of, of distilling it down to, to what's really necessary and what can you kind of let slip. Yeah, you did. You did a great job with that. So Thanks. I will uh, I will leave you with uh, telling the viewers, uh, please check out Joe's book or Joe's series. Um, even if you're like me and you typically read police procedurals or psychological thrillers, you will not be disappointed with this. It's it's great action, great characters. Um, you know, I couldn't get enough of it. So great job, Joe. And I will hand it off to you to oh. speak with Bill. Thanks so much, man. Um, and, and I think we're a really interesting trio because I, I do think of Matt as sort of like the psychological thriller one. And, and I think of myself as sort of action adventure. Um, there's always a little bit of mystery in my books, but not too much. Enough to keep you guessing, like, where's it going? But, but Bill, the thing, one of the things I love about your Philadelphia legal series and criminal justice was, was definitely in this vein is you start out with a mystery. And, and look, I'm one of those guys who like, when I go into the movie, five minutes in, I'm like, okay, who did it, right? Who's the killer? Um, I never know where your plots are going. I never, um, yeah, engineered injustice, I blurbed that one. This one, I never know who did it in your books. H how, do you, how do you go about, because we didn't talk about your process, how do you construct plots that are so intricate and are so good about hiding, you know, um, the, the ball in terms of, of who's behind it all? Yeah, well, what I do is uh, I, when I write a book, I know how it's going to end. And I know maybe three or four major, you know, plot points where it's going to turn or there'll be a big reveal. But other than that, when I'm writing chapter by chapter, it's, it's organic. I'll put two people in a room. I'll have them start a conversation. I'll have a general idea where the conversation has to go, but then I'll have them talking to each other. And, you know, the conversation will go the way that it, the way that it goes. Um, for me, knowing who the bad guy is and, and how it's going to end actually helps me hide that 
because I know that I have for every clue that I give about that person or whatever, I've got to steer the reader over here a little bit and then over there a little bit. Um, so that the, you know, the reader is surprised at the end, but you know, the, the challenge in writing a book where the ending be, is a surprise is it's gotta be a legitimate surprise. I mean, it can't be some character who was spoken about you know, in, in two or three pages and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, they're the bad guy. It's gotta be someone who the reader knows about, knows a lot about, is somewhat emotionally invested in. And, and for me, that's one of the things I, I like to do is like in a criminal justice, you have two very strong women, Marcy Hansen and Piper McFarland. Um, Piper McFarland is fighting for the life of her husband who's been convicted of murdering Marcy's husband's brother, okay? And these two women, and do not like each other. Marcy hates Piper for reasons That's for sure. yeah, that become apparent, but they're very strong. They're very resourceful. And, and even though, you know, one of them is bad, you, you're emotionally invested in them because you, yep. you learn about their backstory and the, and the hard things they had to overcome to get to where they are. Um, and, and even the good person does bad things. So like in my books, you have bad people doing bad things and good people doing bad things. Um, yep. But for the main characters, I try to get you emotionally invested in them. I, I try to get you to say, I understand why they do what they do. And even though ultimately what they do may be really bad, there are parts of them that I, that I like. And, um, you know, the other hard part is if, if you have a, a very strong good guy, you got to have a very strong bad guy. You can't have a, a, a measly little bad guy. Otherwise, the good guy's triumph at the end means nothing. So in, in criminal justice, um, Piper finds herself pitted against rich, powerful people and a mysterious person in the background who she doesn't even know who it is or why they're doing what they're doing. And she has to somehow, as Mick's wife, figure out how to, how to get him out of jail, how to free him from, the, you know, from these charges. And um, so that was, that was the mission I set out for her. Well, and, and you, mentioned, you, know, you mentioned two of the characters of the book. Um, but you also mentioned you know, having to misdirect the reader and stuff. I, I think... One of, the, in, one of the things that's so well done in your whole series, I mean, you can pick up a criminal justice and just read this book and everyone should do that. But as you read across the series, you have built this sort of tableau of characters where you know, people come in, people come out, you have different focuses in the different books. But even in this book, we get to sit with so many different characters. You know, Mick's brother, uh, the cops, um, all these, you know, some of the, some of the criminals, right? All of these different figures. Um, can you pick a character who maybe you didn't think you really cared about in the book going in, who just sort of like jumped to life and, and sort of took on a life of their own? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. For me, at the beginning of the series, Marcy Hansen, who was David Hansen's wife, David Hansen in the very first book is a, he's a millionaire. He's accused of murder and Piper's husband, Mick becomes his lawyer. Marcy, who's David's wife was really just going to be like a plot foil. She was only going to exist so that David could have someone to talk to rather than think about stuff. As the series unfolded, she became much deeper, much stronger, much more powerful um, as a character who has very concrete plans, very concrete feelings, um, and is amazingly resourceful. So she was supposed to be basically a two-dimensional name, and she popped out. Um, let, me, let me take that and ask you, Matt, have you written any books where 
you start out with a character and you think, well, maybe they're going to be like this. And then they, they just say, no, I'm bigger than you think I am. I'm going to play a more important role here. Well, it's funny in tell me the truth. <clears throat> it happened to the extreme where, you know, obviously not by the, probably the second or third draft, but initially, um, Charlie, the little boy, the son, the brother and the son, um, was not even going to have a point of view. So he was kind of in it just kind of as a member of the family, friends with Bobby, who, you know, that takes a a road itself. Um, But he just, there was just something about him, something about like his, his boyish innocence that I just wanted to kind of explore that a little bit more. And it got to a point where he needs his own point of view. And as soon as I created that point of view for him, it opened up the story from kind of a, you know, two dimensional, maybe three dimensional story where there's a couple of ways you can go with it to what it is today, where there's, you know, there's a lot of suspects, anyone could be, you know, possibly uh, guilty. And um, so it's funny you bring that up because that's exactly what happened with, with um, Tell Me the Truth and Charlie. Yeah. And he, he, when you added his point of view, in addition to Liam's point of view and Susan's point of view, he knows things about his family that he's exactly. a reader from the inside. Right, right. There's a whole lot to the story. Um, Joe, let me talk about Seth Walker. When you first designed yeah. him, was he as he is now? Uh, or did he evolve over time? Is he growing in the series? I hope so. Um, and, and that was kind of the plan. I mean, when, when I... When I came up with Walker, I came up with him as a series character and I, I sort of plotted out an arc for him. I didn't really want it to be the, the, the two advantages I saw to using an air marshal were number one, it didn't have to be every book's a serial killer or every book's kind of like a riff on the same plot. I, I can do a lot of different kinds of stories. And, you know, so take off is a bodyguard story and false horizons, a plane crash investigation and my latest book, Departures, a missing persons case. Um, so he deals with different kinds of stuff. Um, the other thing is he's, he's plunged in as an investigator, which isn't really his training. And so I think, I, I hope in every, in every book he gets better, right? He, he gets more sort of adept at what he's doing. He learns the ropes a little bit more. Um, he also necessarily becomes a little more jaded. Right. And, and a little more worldwide in terms of what he's up against and, and the forces that are you know, trying to foil him. And so, yeah, I think I hope by the end of departure, he's a much different guy than than you started out with at the at the start of takeoff. That's the plan. OK, so um, let me conclude by asking each of you, um, just tell us what your social media credentials are so that if people want to find you, they know where to look. Matt, how about you first? Oh boy. Twitter. I am at M Farrell writer. I think <laughs> Facebook is definitely Matthew Farrell books <laughs> and Instagram, I think is also M Farrell writer, but okay. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a huge social media fan. Um, I I'm on it. I'm active on it um, as much as I can be, but um, you know, yeah, I think that's my credentials. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Joe, how about you? Yeah, I'm I'm basically Joseph Reed Books everywhere uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. On Facebook, they added a one to it, so I'm Joseph Reed Books one instead of Joseph Reed Books. But um, but it's the same as my website. I'm I'm probably most religiously on Instagram. I post a a photograph from a different airport every day, yeah. um, and that that's kind of my thing. But um, but yeah, I, I try and be on like Matt said. I you know, I, I try and res- be responsive and, and things like that, but um, real life gets in the way, but I'm, I'm at least posting a, a photo every day. Yeah, and I know with, with both of you and with me, if you Google us or go to Amazon, yes. it's easy to find books. Yep. Um, and I hope to be reading more of both of you soon. Um, for everybody out there, this is William L. Myers Jr. You're listening to Writing Wrongs, my podcast on the author's on the air global radio network and today i had the 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 privilege and the fun time of talking with joe reed and matt farrell 
two of my uh, friends at Amazon and Thomas and Mercer and two great, great young authors. So thank you both for being on board and thank you to everybody who's listening to this or watching it. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Bill.